Assalamu alaikum, and the proper response is, and also with you, good, we are having Muslim Sunday here at the Meeting House, and we have a Muslim in the house, woot woot, yeah, so here's what we're going to do, we are in the middle of a three-part series on ISIS, Islam, and Jesus, our focus, of course, as Christians is to stare into the teachings of Jesus and say, Jesus, how should we respond to much of what we hear in the media and much of what we see on television and the misinformation and accurate information and, and how our focus is always on Jesus, how do we respond? Part of that, though, is as we follow Jesus, we want to become conversant with and understand our neighbors around us and what they believe as well, and so we want to uh, not just hear it second hand, but also have an opportunity to engage first hand. And so today we're going to have a chance just to learn a bit about Islam and a bit about the contrast between Islam and Christianity in some areas, things in common and things that are different. One of the things that we've been talking about we would like to do is demonstrate the fact that in order to have civility and... and um, uh, encouraging conversation that is not threatening, you don't have to pretend you agree about stuff. You don't have to pretend that you uh, basically believe the same stuff, which is a very common line in today's culture. Well, all religions believe basically the same thing. You know, all kind of believe in God, and you've got some scriptures, and you're all... And that's almost like a thing we tell ourselves so that we can feel comfortable about people who believe things that are different than us. And so one of the things that Sadat and I would like to demonstrate today is that you can be very forthright in how much you agree and disagree and still come away with gentleness and respect having guided the conversation. So we'll see we'll do that. Or else it'll break down into fisticuffs, one or the other, but it's going to be fun. I also want to mention that... Uh, the imam we were going to have today had to cancel it yesterday because of a death in the family. And so we, some of you got my tweet yesterday, and we as a congregation have been praying for him and for his family. But Sadat then is like a last minute step in and uh, is a volunteer at his mosque. And so we want to doubly welcome not only Sadat, but his wife is here and um, your son. I don't know if they're sitting there. Yeah, right down here. So we want to say welcome to the whole family. We're glad you guys are here. <laughs> So, uh, what's that g greeting mean? As, uh, you know, the rest of it. Uh, As-salam alaykum. Salam on you. Peace on you. Like the Jews say, uh, shalom alaykum. Yes. Yes. Like this. Good. And the proper response would really be? Uh, the reversal. Alaykum salam. On you be peace. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Your, your congregation, tell us a bit about this and about your role there. Right. Uh, so, I'm really just uh, an irregular volunteer at uh, Tariq Mosque. Uh, which is located at Jane Street and Wilson Avenue. That's the uh, city of York, close to North York in Toronto. Um, and uh, Tariq stands for, it's an abbreviation, it stands for Toronto and Region Islamic Congregation. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, when the Imam is not able to do uh, mosque tours, for example, because we have World Village and High School classes that come in mm -hmm. for mosque tours, so I'm often uh, a stand-in uh, for, for the Imam in doing those mosque tours. And our center has been there since 1990. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've been attending there since uh, I was a young teenager. And all of you are welcome to drop by any time. That's fantastic. So you are a volunteer there. You have a day job, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And what, what I like about Sadat, he's very articulate. And he sets the bar high for the rest of you who are volunteers for the next time you're invited to go and represent all of us at a mosque. <laughs> uh, uh, now, Islam is divided into what we might think of as denominations. You know, we have Catholic and Protestant. We're Anabaptist. Uh, tell us a bit about that and where you guys fit into that. Yeah. So to make it simple, there are two main denominations. There's the Sunni branch and the Shia branch. Um, and uh, uh, so our congregation is part of the Sunni Muslim world. Uh, Sunni Islam is the mainstream or the orthodox Islam. It accounts for about 85% of the Muslim world population. And the remaining 15% is more or less the, rem the remaining Shia minority. Mm -hmm. uh, Shias are a majority in Iran and uh, now a slim majority in Iraq as well, I believe. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. And a typical service, a typical, your meeting on Fridays would be your primary prayer time. Yes. What would we experience if we were attending there? So if you walked into a mosque uh, on Friday afternoon around 1 p.m., 1.30 p.m., that's the time of our congregational prayer. Mm -hmm. um, people would be taking off their shoes and uh, sitting on the ground because when we worship, we sit on the ground, we kneel, uh, we prostrate with our face to the ground, mm -hmm. uh, much in the way as in Genesis, it says Abraham fell on his face and prayed. Mm -hmm. um, and the imam or the prayer leader would deliver a short 20, 25 minute uh, uh, lecture or sermon mm -hmm. as part of that service, okay. uh, which is in the vernacular, in the language of the people. So okay. here it would be in English. Okay. What, what is the honorary title, Sheikh? 
Well, imam and sheikh can overlap. Sheikh is one of those ambiguous terms. Uh, sometimes it can refer to a religious scholar. Mm -hmm. uh, in this context, certainly, when we say Sheikh Imran Ali, we mean that he's the imam, the prayer leader of the mosque, and mm -hmm. he's a scholar of Islam. Um, in a more general or generic sense, Sheikh can also mean uh, just uh, uh, an older man or even a man over the age of 40, just a respectful title. Okay, so right. you would be Sheikh Braxi Thank in many Arab countries. <clears throat> I just got a promotion. I appreciate that. Uh, the Quran is your source book. You are also not only learning from the Quran, but am I right to say that you are looking to the example of Muhammad to best know how to live out what the Quran is teaching? Is that fair? Yes. And the, and the life of Muhammad is learned through the Hadith? Tell us a bit about how yes. the Qur'an and the Hadith complement yes. each other. So the distinction between the Qur'an and the Hadiths is that we believe that the Qur'an are the words of God verbatim, the mm -hmm. words of God directly. In Arabic language, uh, word in, for word is what God has chosen exactly. to, said, to exactly. say. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in a manner similar to uh, what you might believe about the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. So the Ten Commandments in Hebrew uh, you know, came directly from God to the Prophet Moses. You wouldn't credit the Prophet Moses with any of that. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't say, oh, he was a very good, gifted, creative writer. Mm -hmm. No, he simply heard and then he conveyed the message to the yes. rest of the people. For us, the entire Qur'an uh, from start to finish is like that. It's the words of God verbatim. Um, but the other main source uh, of, of uh, Islamic beliefs and Islamic le uh, legislation comes from the Hadiths, uh, which are recordings, uh, reports of what the Prophet Muhammad said and did. Hmm. Because in his uh, ministry, obviously, he didn't only preach the Qur'an. There must have been other things that he said and talked about. And uh, so the hadiths are a clarification and an elaboration. And the first source of exegesis of the Qur'an. Right. Right. Okay. So we, and we have our New Testament that uh, it, it brings a new way of living out of the Old Testament. I mean, that's why we, we as Christians refer to the Hebrew Bible as the Old Covenant or the Old Testament. Is there something similar to that in Islam, the, uh, of, of the abrogation of what was said earlier? Was there any, any uh, changes in revelation in the life of Muhammad over that time? Yes, we believe that the uh, eternal truths that all prophets taught, these are six main beliefs, the oneness of God, belief in the angels, belief in scriptures or revelation that God gave, mm -hmm. belief in the prophets, belief in the afterlife, mm -hmm. which is very important, mm -hmm. uh, very important because it tells us that there's a higher moral and spiritual purpose to our lives yep. rather than just living, eating, talking, working. Yep. Uh, the sixth belief is in, sometimes it's translated as fate, or you can say the foreknowledge of God. God in his infinite knowledge knows the past, present, and the future, meaning where, when, how, we're going to die, etc. Yeah. These beliefs, we believe, were taught by all of the prophets. Yeah. But the law, the sharia, uh, the commandments, if you like, those, of course, differed over time according to circumstances, okay. time, and place. Yes, yes. Uh, Adam's sharia, his uh, sacred law that was given to him by God, consisted of just one law. Yes. Don't go near that tree. Right. Uh, Moses' law consisted of many more. Yeah. Uh, Islam's law in general I would say is uh, more restrictive than, than what I see most uh, Christians following, especially in the Protestant tradition, yeah. but it's not as restrictive as the Jewish old law. Okay, yep. yeah. Yeah, so so we don't eat swine or pig for example, but we don't have any uh, restrictions on mixing meat, right. i.e. halal meat and yes. dairy products okay, for example. Yes, yes. I can have a cheeseburger. You know. Okay, yes, good. Yeah. I knew we'd be friends. Is there a complete agreement on the Hadith, or are there different traditions of the Hadith that some schools of thought will accept and others not? Uh, that is correct. So the Hadiths are classified in regards to their authenticity, mm -hmm. um, and they are analyzed um, in regards to their chain of transmission. In other words, how did we get this report? Who said it? You have to footnote it. You have to reference it. Where did it come from? And on this point, there, there is some disagreement among scholars as to whether certain reports are reliable, mm -hmm. authentic reports or not. Right, yeah. right. There's a similarity in that we have a holy book, and we also have a holy person that we turn to to help us understand how to live out the teachings of our holy book. Mm -hmm. uh, in that sense, you have both the Quran and you have Muhammad, his life, and you want to follow his example. You would see him as the, the closest perfect example in a human life for you to follow and emulate. Yes. The, so Sharia law comes in the form of, is, is it worked out relationally with those who are judges uh, using their knowledge of the Quran to enact it? Or is there a book? This, here's, the, here's the Sharia law handbook. There are handbooks of fiqh. Uh, fiqh means uh, Islamic jurisprudence. And that is the Quranic law 
and the extra Quranic commandments of the Prophet Muhammad, known as hadiths, mm. uh, the interpretation and the working out of that and the implementation of that and the fine details of that are worked out by jurists. Okay. And yes, you can find those worked out laws in uh, law manuals, if you like, books of fiqh. Um, not so different from the idea of our Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Yeah. The law gets passed, uh, but then the law has to work its way through the courts and it gets worked out by the judges, and then the judges uh, and their cases set precedents, which later judges uh, will often feel uh, that, that they should follow, or at least use as a guideline. All right. Okay, good. Oh, so how about Jesus? Where does he fit into all of this? So our, uh, and obviously this is a source of disagreement, um, but we believe in Jesus Christ, uh, peace be upon him, as a mighty prophet, a messenger, a servant uh, sent by God. Uh, sometimes Christians will say Muslims believe Jesus is just a prophet, uh, as though just a prophet is just any old thing. So uh, for us in the Islamic cosmology, prophets are higher than the angels, you know, they're mm. closer to God. Mm. So when we say that Jesus is just a prophet, we mean that he's sinless, that he was a perfect model for humanity, he was directly sent and commissioned by God. We believe in his... Uh, uh, virgin birth, that mm -hmm. he cured the lepers and healed the death by the permission of God Almighty. And uh, in a nutshell, we're somewhere between the Jews and the Christians, because uh, the Jews, uh, on the whole, mm -hmm. rejected Jesus and said he's a false prophet, he's not mm -hmm. the Messiah. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas our Christian friends uh, say not only that he's the Messiah, but that he is in some sense divine, mm -hmm. uh, the divine Son of God or part of the Trinity. So Muslims who are supposed to be extremists, mind you, uh, are somewhere in the middle and we say that uh, Jesus is not a liar or a false prophet, uh, but that he's been misunderstood by our friends, uh, Christian friends, to be uh, God in the flesh. Rather, he's a prophet, messenger, teacher sent by God. Uh, we love him, we respect him, we revere him, uh, we try to look like him. Uh, <laughs> you look like him as well, too. Jesus plus 80 pounds yes, right yes. here. Yeah. Our women try to dress, uh, you know, like the mother of Jesus, uh, but we draw the line at worship. Uh, worship mm -hmm. and prayer, we believe, is exclusively for God alone. Mm -hmm. And when we say Allah, what we intend by that, what we mean by that, uh, is essentially the uh, God the Father of mm -hmm. the New Testament. Okay, yes. So some Christians are surprised that you have such high regard for Jesus, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and yet... It's still distinct from how we would relate to him. There's an interesting aspect of Christ's life. I mean, you accept the virgin birth, which is fascinating, but it is his death where we have our probably sharpest disagreement when we look at the life of Jesus, the whole Jesus narrative. Mm -hmm. uh, I am fascinated by this aspect of the Quran's teaching. Tell us about how the Quran uh, looks at the crucifixion of Jesus. Yes. Well, just to add for one moment that mm -hmm. uh, point about the high regard for Jesus is that in Muslim circles, when Muslims are amongst themselves, we would see it as almost uncivil to say just Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus could just be any old South American backpacker in Brazil. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, mm -hmm. we would say uh, Nabi Isa alayhi salam, the Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him. Mm -hmm. uh, or we would say Hadrat Isa alayhi salam, the Honorable Jesus, mm -hmm. peace be upon him. Mm -hmm. Or we would say Sayyidna Isa alayhi salam, our Master Jesus, peace be upon him. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, to answer the question about the crucifixion, it is true uh, that the Quran says that Jesus was not crucified. Uh, it, it says that God, uh, you know, God did not forsake him. God rescued him from the plans of his enemies to assassinate mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. But the details of the escape plan are not worked out. I mean, they are not given to us in the Quran. So this has led to uh, a tradition uh, whereby uh, the majority of scholars have explained that um, Jesus' face was imposed uh, on another person. So God supernaturally intervened uh, and, and uh, imposed Jesus' likeness or his face on someone else, possibly Judas, mm -hmm. uh, who then went up on the cross and died in his place, willingly or unwillingly. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, there are other scholars and other thinkers, such as Dr. Shabir Ali uh, here in mm -hmm. Toronto. Who uh, we tried to get for oh, today. Oh, I see, yes, I see. But, so so, so yeah. Sheikh Imran was a stand-in for someone else. Uh, yeah, and you're yeah. a third yeah. fiddle yes, stand-in, yeah, yeah, so, you yeah. know, whatever. <laughs> I but, get the bronze prize. Yeah, 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 right. And you know, I'm kind of glad that you're here. Thank you. That's good. But, uh, so the other view that Dr. Shabir Ali, for example, yeah. uh, I, I think would subscribe to would be that, no, Jesus did go up on the cross, but when he was brought down, you know, he had not died yet. He mm -hmm. fell into a swoon or fell into a coma coma rather, yeah. uh, he was uh, resuscitated and uh, in any event we believe in the ascension, uh, that God physically raised Jesus up to the heavens hmm. where he's in God's good care and God's uh, custody uh, until he returns for his second coming, uh, at which point he will sort out the Christians. It's sure. <laughs> <laughs> good. Are you catching this so that Jesus is about to be crucified or at some point during the, the, the passion and the, uh, the um, road to the cross, God switches Jesus and Judas 
and Judas is crucified in Christ's face, appearing to be like, I mean, that's, that's got a sweet justice to it. So you're not a complete pacifist then, yeah? Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> as, long, <laughs> as long as the Romans do it, I'm, uh, and I kill zombies in video games, so there, I'm outed. <laughs> yeah. So it's interesting, right? We've got such agreement on virgin birth and sinless life, and he is the, considered the Messiah with that title yes, within sir. Islam. Um, and yet his, the, his deity and his death are those two, very, for us, very significant points of, of disagreement. Um, and I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about that uh, when we're done talking. But let's, let's also talk about uh, your understanding of kingdom, of caliphate, and also your understanding looking overseas of ISIS, and how, how do you think about that and about some of the, the violence within the name of Islam around the world. Uh, give us some of your thoughts mm. on that. So there's a spectrum uh, amongst Muslims, just as there's a spectrum amongst Christians. Uh, and some are certainly more politically oriented than others, are mm -hmm. more world oriented, you might say, than others. But mm -hmm. I believe that Islam teaches both concepts, not just the physical uh, kingdom or caliphate, um, but definitely there is the idea of the spiritual, um, we might not, might not call it kingdom, but uh, mm -hmm. the idea of spiritual fellowship of believers, mm -hmm. uh, and that is called uh, the concept of the ummah, you know, mm -hmm. the mother community of Muslims. Mm -hmm. So with or without a state, the ummah still exists, yes. the, the family, the fellowship of the followers of the Prophet Muhammad, that still exists. Mm -hmm. But it is true that Islam also encompasses a political aspect as well. Uh, since we believe that Islam is not just a religion but a complete way of life revealed mm -hmm. by God, mm -hmm. uh, a complete way of life would not, would not only tell you how to worship in a temple on a particular day, mm -hmm. but it would tell you how to interact with your neighbors, what are citizen rights, what do you do with thieves, what do you, how do you uh, implement laws. Mm -hmm. uh, so that political aspect is what we refer to as the Islamic State or the Caliphate, yeah. not necessarily you know, ISIS's version of that. Okay, yes. So Ultimately, that would be that, that is a difference in our understanding of kingdom. We track together with the understanding of the internal kingdom or caliphate, our submission to God that unites us into a brotherhood, into a global family that transcends race or nationality. But then beyond that, uh, our, as Muslims, a caliphate would include then the political geographical place where that gets lived out holistically. Yes, yes. It, it, is it fair to say then that that is something that could be achieved through violence if the violence is used justly. In other words, I don't want us to impose upon you our ideal of nonviolence that we take from Jesus and say, hey, wait, Muslims are being violent in any context. Yes. Uh, that's, that's our ideal. But you follow the standard of Muhammad, which mm. it seems to me is trying to use a just war theory mm. for using violence appropriately rather than objecting to all violence. Yes. So in the example of the Prophet Muhammad, we see both examples. We see the example of him uh, being like Jesus when he was in a situation similar to that of Jesus. Mm. So when Prophet Muhammad was part of a persecuted minority in Mecca, mm -hmm. uh, then certainly turning the other cheek and repelling uh, evil with good and all of this is part and parcel of that. Um, uh, but then on the other hand, when you're in the position of King David, when you're in the position of King Solomon, now obviously a different set of rules apply. And I must make the disclaimer just to be responsible that yes. the majority of Canadian Muslims may not necessarily agree with me on that. Mm -hmm. um, now whether they sincerely don't agree or whether they're just scared to voice their opinion, uh, but we have many nominal Muslims just like you guys have many yeah. nominal Christians. Yes. Uh, so I want to make it clear that uh, there'd be liberal Muslims out there that would say no, you know, you shouldn't mix politics and religion and stuff like that. I think they haven't thought out uh, their worldview very carefully. They haven't thought out Islam very carefully. And certainly their views go against 1400 years of the grain yeah. of our uh, scholastic tradition or our normative tradition, yes. which does see a role of religion in politics. And to those people, I mean, this is a big topic, but just to finish on that, when uh, people often ask, do you believe in mixing politics and religion? Yeah. I ask, do you believe in mixing politics and ethics? Okay. Now, surely no one will say, no, no, no we should divorce politics from ethics. Okay okay, but where do your ethics come from? Yeah. Uh, if you're a Christian, I imagine that your ethics would come from the Bible. They would come from the New Testament. And therefore, religion will always get mixed into politics. And to try to divorce them completely, I think, is a very artificial uh, type of divorce. Right.
So the, the idea of separation of church and state, that's not a Quranic idea. No. no. Um, so I think you made a very good point about not uh, superimposing the expectations of one's own faith yes. and the assumptions of one's own faith on another faith. Mm. Uh, that would be similar to me um, uh, pointing at a police officer and saying, I'm better than him because he carries a gun. Mm -hmm. I don't carry a gun. I'm a peaceful person. Mm -hmm. uh, no, the police officer has a different role to play. Mm -hmm. And so the Islamic State on, on the political level has a different role to play. And in short, yes, uh, we believe that there's an appropriate time for violence uh, and there's an appropriate time for peace. And it only becomes oppression and wrong and unethical when it is taken out of its proper place and done at the wrong time or in the wrong manner. Um, is, uh, it's fair to point out that we cannot project our pacifism on Islam. Islam is not committed to a, a, a way of pacifism. There is, uh, it's, it's a just war religion, in a sense, which is the majority of Christians would hold to, to that position. We don't, but the uh, majority of Christians would. So, so the possibility of violence is not in and of itself wrong from a Muslim point of view. It is the just use of it. Uh, I think you said it very well. So there is an appropriate time for peace, mm -hmm. and there's an appropriate time for violence. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've asked many um, pacifist Christians uh, from groups like Brethren in Christ. I hope mm -hmm. I got it right. You did your homework. Brethren in Christ. Way to go. And uh, I asked yeah. many of them. I said, look, tell me honestly, you know, I mean, if I just slapped you right now, uh, you know, what would you do? And most of them were honest and said, yeah, you know, I'd slap you back, but, you know, I'm a sinner, I'm not Jesus, and uh, etc. cetera. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I want to I want to tell you the full truth. There were a couple of them that said, "You know what? I would I would turn the other cheek and I would let you hit me." And I actually believed them. Yeah. No, I really did believe them because yes. they spoke with the same conviction that I see in you when yes. you speak. I believed them. But then I asked them, "What if I were to slap your wife here that's standing next to you?" Yes. He said, "Yeah, then I'd slap you back." Yes, and yes. if he didn't do that, what else could he do? He would right. call the police officer who would come running with his yes. baton yes. and his gun yes. and the threat, if not the actual use of violence yes. to impose a certain amount of order yes. and law. Yeah. So uh, there's an appropriate time for violence, we believe. Point of view then, taking that ideology to ISIS, the topic of ISIS, what about ISIS is wrong? Okay. If anything, what, where would you stand in your opinion of that? So as one example, uh, the, um, and by the way, most Muslims would look at ISIS as, you know, loonies and, and pretty crazy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, not because they want the idea of the caliphate, but in the way that they've gone to implement that. One mm -hmm. practical example, uh, concrete example would be that in the Quran, in chapter 60, uh, verse 8, uh, it says that God does not prohibit you from dealing kindly and justly with those who did not fight on, uh, against you on account of your religion. Hmm. or drive you out of your homes. Hmm. So the Quran, chapter 60, verse 8, is saying, you treat pas Pastor Bruxy well. You treat the brethren in Christ well because they haven't attacked you. They're not fighting you on account of your faith. They haven't driven you out of your homes. When but you take over, we'll still be your friends. Yes, I'll okay. remember, I'll okay. remember okay. Bruxy. Okay. Yeah. Um, but uh, ISIS, uh, you know, with the uh, killing of uh, Jim Foley, who I think was just mm -hmm. a journalist, I hope I got the name mm -hmm. right, uh, this would contravene that idea because mm -hmm. he was a disbeliever by Islamic standards, but he was not there fighting and he was not there forcing anybody into a refugee camp. Mm -hmm. So this is something that Muslims look at as uh, actually a very cowardly and an unmanly act, okay. a dishonorable so act. And if, they are, if it's as simple as that, that they're giving people the un-Islamic option, of convert or die, mm -hmm. uh, then certainly in principle we would condemn that. We would say that's un-Islamic and so we're in agreement, I think, about that. Um, what, what would be the Islamic option? The Islamic option when there is an Islamic state, yes. when there is a political Islamic authority, yes. is convert yes. or pay the jizya right. uh, or fight. The jizya being a sort of a, a tribute tax mm -hmm. that the minorities give in an Islamic state mm -hmm. in return for protection of their rights and freedoms and uh, freedom of worship. Okay. All right. So it, it uh, okay, good. Um, but I wanted to say a, a word just to look at the bigger picture, yes, which yes. is that in, in regards to, to the bigger picture of radicalism uh, mm -hmm. uh, amongst Muslims and the Muslim youth, uh, is that if we were to take a step back and remove ourselves from mm -hmm. this church, um, if we were to pretend for a minute that we're space aliens in a video game, uh, and uh, <laughs> let's forget uh, that you're a Canadian and a Baptist in Oakville, I'll forget that I'm an Easterner or a Muslim let's become objective space aliens that are just hovering in a spaceship above the earth, hmm. observing human beings. Hmm. Now what I'm going to say now really is radical. 
Uh, but I, I honestly believe that these space aliens observing us would not be so concerned and would not be asking the question of why are Muslims so violent. Mm. I honestly believe that the space aliens would ask other questions such as why is this nation, America, so violent? Mm. Uh, why is it that America invaded Vietnam. Vietnam didn't invade America. Mm. America invaded Korea. Korea didn't invade America. America invaded Somalia. Somalia didn't invade America. America bombed a pharmaceutical company uh, in Sudan in the 1990s that provided most of the medicines for the Sudanese children. Mm. Sudan never flew thousands of miles over the ocean to come and uh, attack America. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why did America invade Iraq? Iraq didn't invade America. America invaded Afghanistan. We could go on and on and on. We're not mm -hmm. talking about military coups and so forth. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that's the larger picture. And I think that some of the violence that we see in the Muslim world is a, is a response to a much larger violence that is being mm. perpetrated against them. Right. Best definition that of, of uh, terrorism that I ever heard in my life was from an, an American comic book, Uncanny X-Men, where Wolverine says that terrorism is what the big army calls the small army. And I think there's, mm. there's some truth to that. Mm. Better understand ISIS and perhaps a Muslim response to ISIS, although there cannot be maybe, maybe one unified Muslim response. There's going to be diversity. We grant you that. We would say... It is not the fact that ISIS uses violence to help advance a caliphate in and of itself that's wrong. It is that they are not practicing the violence in a just way, in a way that the Quran would govern. That would be correct. Okay. Um, uh, talk, uh, talk to us. If you had, you know, you give a 20-minute tour, and now, now you only have six minutes left. Okay. If you wanted to give us the highlights of, if you said, I would want, here's what I would want you to know about Islam, uh, what would it be? In, I want to reserve two minutes, so now it's, you only got four. Uh, very different, uh, very difficult to summarize in six minutes, yeah. uh, but I would say uh, an absolute, uh, like an emphasis on the absolute oneness of God. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's many religions out there that say that God is one, but. Mm. God is one, however. Mm -hmm. uh, Islam teaches that God is one, yes. period. Yes. No ifs, no buts. Yes. Uh, it makes perfect sense in Arabic. It also makes sense in Hebrew, makes yes. sense in English, makes yes. sense in Chinese, makes sense in every language of the world. One is one. Yeah. Um, how can we serve you? This is our theme question for this series. We disagree about a good many things. Um, we are both evangelistic faiths. So, uh, well, I want you to become a Christian. You would like me to become a Muslim. Um, we could talk all day and both be thinking we're having a good time. Uh, <laughs> but in the meantime... Uh, uh, what I do love about this is that we're both forthright about where we stand. One of the things we've been talking about b backstage is that it's often in the media easy for the liberal versions of any faith to get together. And we see that in the media. You get the most liberal Muslim, most liberal of Christians to say, you know, we're all basically the same. There's no differences. It's all just to make everyone feel good. And it's nice. I think we are both very committed to our respective understanding of who God is and how we're called to live and yet uh, can still be friends as we, as we uh, convert one another. So <laughs> what would you say to us then as a congregation? Say, how can we serve you, your congregation, uh, and just Muslim friends and neighbors that we know? Yeah, uh, It's a difficult question. I mean, um, you know, for me personally, my stomach is the way to my heart, so if you know how to cook some roti, <laughs> that would be a nice start. Uh, I knew we were soulmates. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, for the congregation at large, uh, really I believe that on this particular point uh, mm -hmm. of advancing dialogue, uh, and, and recognizing our differences, not trying to gloss over those differences, mm -hmm. but having respectful dialogue in spite of that. I, I really think that on this point, you and your congregation are on the right path. Um, mm -hmm. all, um, another you know, uh, you know, practical idea would be perhaps to bring uh, small groups of people from yes. your congregation to our mosque, mm -hmm. to the Tariq Mosque, where we would be happy to have you, uh, give you a mosque tour, answer some more questions, and you could speak to us and, and share your views as well. This is fantastic. You had less than 24 hours to be here this morning when you heard about this and you have really blessed us by prioritizing this and being here you your wife and your son thank you thank so you for much me. yes thank let's you for thank you thank you man so great <laughs>